Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Tony. I'm, welcome to another episode of Crime Paper by Any Dozen. Today, I was coming to you from Craters of the Moon uh, National Monument, which is really just a, a rather large uh, flood basalt flow that erupted between uh, 15,000 and 2,000 years ago. It was, a series of, it was a series of about eight different flows. You could see we're, we're looking at the uh, ropey pa'oi oi lava, which I like to pronounce pahoho both because it sounds ridiculous and because it irritates the shit out of people who would otherwise try to correct you, which uh, is funny. Very, very entertaining to watch people who do that kind of shit get so irritated with you. But uh, anyway, uh, we're going to check out the plant life here. You could see uh, the predicament that uh, plants might encounter while growing uh, on uh, like this completely black, uh, very lacking in soil, almost completely lacking in soil, uh, rocky Outcrops. So this is really my kind of habitat. You see plants do some very interesting shit. They get 20 inches of rain here a year, but uh, most of it just flows right into the basalt and then into the uh, aquifer below, later flowing out in uh, springs and seeps of the Snake River Canyon. But uh, the, the geology of this place is pretty interesting. You know, you normally get the, you normally get the subduction zone volcanics uh, in the area right to the east we got yellowstone which is hot spot volcanism which is the same type of volcanism that's uh that's created the hawaiian islands but uh, most of the volcanism on planet earth tends to be subduction zone volcanism you know where you have a heavier oceanic plate subducting beneath a much lighter and less dense uh, continental plate but uh, right here uh, with all this basalt this is basically just the uh, the result of extensional tectonics okay it's the result of a rift and in fact uh the uh, volcanic field or the, the the word you hear a lot when they're talking about this volcanic field is uh the great rift and that's indeed what it was it was a series of of cracks of fissures in the earth's crust uh, remember i'm always talking about how salt lake and reno uh, are uh, moving away from each other all right so you've got those extensional tectonics, and as as that crust uh, stretches out, you get these little cracks and fissures that come out, and uh, through those cracks and fissures, you get these uh, epic flood basalts. So this was not the result of a, a volcano per se, or any kind of a cone-shaped dome or cinder cone. This was the result of a, a bunch of different little cracks uh, basically opening up, little stretch marks in the Earth's crust opening up and just spewing out fields of basalt flood basalts is the key word here flood basalts okay really nice when you get those uh on planet earth because they create some very interesting terrain and they're just these massive eruptions of basalt which is a very uh non-viscous lava it's very fluid it's a very fluid lava uh owing to the lack of silica uh, in its chemical makeup remember uh, on one hand of the spectrum you got rhyolite in the middle you got andesite and uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you got uh, you got basalt. And uh, on the rhyolitic side of the spectrum, you got much more silica than the basalt. And that silica is what causes the rhyolite to be viscous. So rhyolite not only wouldn't be black, be more of like a pinkish color, maybe a purple color, but it would be uh, you know rather chunky, rather chunky, and you wouldn't see the pohoho, you wouldn't see the ropey shit, which is evidence of the. Uh, the fluid, the fluidity of this magma. So uh, something to keep in mind, right? So we don't got as much silica as you have. And look at this piece, that's nice, look at that. Different kinds of vesicles, little gas bubbles in there. How about that? So you got more silica, you got more viscosity. Anyway, let's uh, let's keep uh, moving, see what we can find. Look at that. Look at, those, look at all the gas that was in there, lots of gas. I wonder how long this took to cool. Just remember the Rose family right here, Drymochelis. Like the little strawberry leaves. No coincidence, they're in the same family. Another uh, epic rose we got over here, Camabata area. Camabata area, millifolium. Monotypic genus. Rosaceae flowers, five petals, five petals, many stamens. Let's flip it over, look at the sepals on one of these flowers. Ooh, it's very glandular, 
Very, very glandular and sticky. It's got a smell to it, too. I don't mind that smell. Some people do. Look at the leaves, too. Look at the texture of that leaves. All the glands. All the glands on those, those goddamn fern-like leaves. Then you just got the pohoho doing his thing. Look at that. Look at this, this whole piece. Just... You got, a, you got a hawk pissed off behind me. Look at that. They got flows like this in uh, Northern California as well. Got one. Got a flow like this up by Hotland. Dominated by Canyon Live Oak. Oh, there he is. Hotland's on fire right now. <laughs> the, the railroad trestle that I used to work uh, actually just burned. Bet the shareholders will be mad about that one. Pricks. This is hell to walk on. I don't even bring the dogs out here. I just bought Jack a sandwich and sat him in the back of the truck with the windows open. Because this would just tear up his paws. Look at that. So you could tell it was fluid, but it was, you know, you could obviously see that parts of this, uh, this material cooled while uh, while it was still flowing beneath. The, the, the top surface of the magma cooled while down beneath it was still flowing. Like a, think of it like like toothpaste, you know? Like you, you leave toothpaste exposed to the atmosphere, the outer surface, uh, the outer surface uh, turns into a crust, but it's still fluid beneath, you know? You know anybody who forgets to put the cap on? They used to borrow your fucking toothpaste. They forget to put the cap back on. It's so you know, it's so obnoxious. They leave, leave a big crust. Right, let's keep going. Look at that. Look, we got a member of the Chicory tribe of Asteraceae going off there. Nice little Stephanomeria. You see that? Look at those pink ligules. Let's get up close. I already cut myself on a dam. Let's see if we can get a nice, oh, there you go. Never mind the blood on my hands. Look at those, see, you got the five teeth at the end of that tiny ligule. And those long anthers too. Let's get up, let's get a little bit closer. Notice how it's got the photosynthetic stems and uh, almost no leaves, not even vestigial leaves. Oh no, you got one right in there, see that? You got a couple, actually. A couple long, narrow leaves, but most of the energy that it's getting is coming uh, through that stem. Look at those. Oh, look at the styles. Look at those long anther tubes. Chicories always seem to have rather long anther tubes. Look at the phyleries right there. Look at the phyleries and the bracts. How's it do it? How's it? And where does it go into the ground? Way down there? Way down there? Oh, the exposure is going to be all fucked up on this. I can tell. It should be fun. Filming on a black background. So every once in a while, a seed gets lucky and it germinates somewhere where it's able to actually eke out a, uh, a living. Got this guy too. Pence them induce this. Penstem induced this, which we get in Northern California as well. Done flower now. Tiny white penstem flowers. But you got the opposite leaves, of course. Plantagenaceae. You got kind of a dentate margin to it as well. You like vesicles, huh? Look at the color in this pohoho. Look at it. You got blues in there. Blues and browns and blacks and purples and what the shit. Nice color palette you're working with there. What the, what did that? What caused the blue? I just heard a goddamn pika. I just heard a pika. We're at 6,000 feet and I got pikas here. Normally you get those hilarious little bastards up at like 10,000 feet. But sure enough, they're here. You hear this little chirping sound. 
These little furry balls live in the racks. Little furry balls. They they stash all the uh, all the plant material they collect over the year for the winter. Yeah, you know, it does. I mean, it looks like it'd be hot as balls here, and indeed it can be, but there's a cool breeze right now. You got to remember we're at 6,000 feet and we're at a pretty high latitude. Anyway, he's somewhere in there. I was hoping maybe he'd do it again, but anyway, let's keep going. See, the toothpaste tube analogy really works, okay? That's why you get lava tubes when you get these uh, basalt flows because the outer, the, outer, uh, the outer skin hardens into a crust, turns into a crust, but then it keeps flowing down below, and it, it creates these little cavities. Look, right here you got a fern, species of woodsia. Look at that. Look at, the, look at this. Look at the hairs on a stem. Tiny little hairs on a stem. Flip uh, flip those leaves over. You can see the sori on there. That's where all the spores come out of. Ferns get around. Ferns get around. I'll tell you that. Look at that. Jesus Christ, look at that. How old is this particular flow? Two or three thousand years? All the blue in it. Really remarkable. So much blue. What's, what, uh, what's the cause of that? What chemicals causing the blue color? Oh, here's a genus I haven't gotten into too much yet because it's so easy to confuse with another one. All right, but they're both in the carrot family. This is Cymopteris terebinthinus. Okay, you pull one of those little, uh, one of those leaves off and uh, it kind of smells like, uh, it kind of smells like parsley. Got those uh, Ferranocoumarins in there, which so many members of the carrot family uh, have. That's secondary chemistry. Very specific secondary chemistry. Just like mustard's got glucosinolates, the Brassicaceae, the Apiaceae, the carrot family has those Ferranocoumarins. But to, to differentiate the, this genus Cymopteris from the and closely related genus Lomatium, you got to look at the fruits, which are right here. It's done flowering. So you just got those fruits. You can see they got the wings on them. Okay, but it's really, I mean, you know, that's the, that's the thing that's frustrating for me. If it's not in flower, I mean, I guess there's other ways once you become familiar with it, you know, once you've stared at it enough or you've really gotten, you know, really geeked out on it, really gotten amped about it. But when you got to look at the fruits, you know, the character is that, that specific and, you know, the fruits, it's not always going to be in fruit. You're not always going to have that character trait to look at, it, you know, it's what's the fucking point. So I just, you know, I just know it's a carrot. It's APACA. I like them. I appreciate them. A lot of them grow in, in uh, very hot, dry areas of, uh, of the North American West. But, uh, you know, there's a couple. There's a couple that got really interesting flowers when they are going off. Really incredible. Look here, we got a Ariagonum. Ariagonum umbilatum. One of the buckwheats. Many different varieties of this. Look at those. Uh, these are the inflorescence bracts right here. You can see what I call it, umbilatum. It's got an umbel to it these are the inflorescence bracts right here these are the inflorescence branches then you get up to the actual inflorescence christ that's gotta flip these up look at the involucres on there see that you can't it's hard to get in there flip those bunch of those tiny flowers up and at the sudanthium and look at the uh, involucre see there's the there's the involucre the vase that holds all the flowers to it you really got to dissect these bastards. There you go. There's a nice money shot of that involucre. Always get pictures of the involucre. Always pay attention to the involucre when you're trying to identify buckwheats. See? One involucre per, in per inflorescence branch. But sometimes you'll see these capitate inflorescences and they'll have nine involucres in there. Nine little vases, each one containing however many, uh, however many goddamn flowers in it. Anyway, there you go. Then you got these little... Uh, these little kind of mat, this mat of leaves, little spatulate leaves. Ooh, spank me. Look at how ropey the pahoho is. Look at how ropey it is. It's so, it's very, very ropey. It's just like some, some pizza though. You got to add more water to it though. Just like that. Just like you fucked up making the pizza. Though. I was living in Brooklyn once 16 years ago, made a shit ton of pizza. I'm a real shit cook. Okay. Real shit cook. You know, my idea of cooking is throwing a bunch of beans and cheese on a taco and you know, heating it in a pan. But I, I will say, I can cook a meat pizza. Look, speaking of crusts, that blood is finally starting to dry. Finally starting to form my own crust. 
this nice because it was leaking. I was leaking for the past 15 minutes. All right, look at this guy. Look at this fancy bastard right here in the crags. Philadelphus Lewisii. Hydrangeaceae, the hydrangea family. Kind of hate hydrangeas, but I like the family. Look at these flowers. Named after Lewis, who might have been a prick. Should have named it after the slave that they were uh, bringing along with them, forcing to do all the manual labor and work and who they lied to about <laughs> setting him free after the expedition. How do you like them apples? Let's smell this. Oh, it smell. It does indeed smell good. I think it smells good. You get your four petals there, many stamens. Flip that bastard over, you get those uh, opposite leaves down there. What do the sepals look like? Huh? I just got to pull one off. It's fine. What do the sepals look like? Eh. Accuminate. Fancy, though. Smells nice. Texture of that leaf. Just the tiniest hairs on that leaf. The tiniest hairs. For the hot and the dry. For the hot, dry environment. Got to get some nice money shots of those Philadelphia flowers. You can see that. You got about two dozen stamens then right in the center. Only sticking out because there's no anthers on top of it. You got that, looks like a four or five lobed uh, stigma and style in there. How about... Kind of a stunner. Just growing in, a, growing in a crack. Growing in a crack. Growing in a fissure in the lava flow. Look at it. Look at the glands. Look at the glands in it. Look at how sticky that is. It just looks, it looks like one of those uh, High Times magazines we used to look at when I was like 14. <laughs> like go to the go to the music emporium and look at high times can't believe you could make a magazine that was just entirely you know pictures of uh marijuana plants but what if you could do the same thing with all kinds of plants just plant porn cam body area would be in there look at those glands oh my god that's nice okay so we got the barren habitat we got of course the buckwheat growing on it and this one uh, is endemic to the region it's a subspecies of ovaliofolium it's areogonum ovaliofolium subspecies focarium and here it is just growing right on the uh, hot black pumice remember there was this uh, mcdonald's like my parents used to take me to when i was a kid i think it was mostly my dad my mom wouldn't feed me that shit my dad would take me there and i had this pumice is the landscaping I remember throwing up in the ball pit once which was probably due to the food anyway uh, you can see the flowers are basically done okay capitate inflorescences okay resembling Almost a little capitulum. You can see it's, uh, let's flip this guy over, look at the involucre. Oh, you got a series, see, you got a series of involucres in there. Not just one. You got a series of involucres. Got a series of little vases that hold all the rest of the flowers. Looks like you got, Christ, how many? At least six, more like eight. But you can see those tepals on those little flowers uh, are all dried up. Fasilia histata, which can be a rather robust plant when it's not growing on barren lava fields. You can see these uh, these little buckwheats, though. So that plant, the you know the above ground portion is just this little you know uh, softball sized glob, but uh, the roots probably spread out. Christ, you know at least to there. You can see. I mean, that's kind of what keeps them separated is the the roots interfering. Yeah, look, look, it's hard. Hard to believe this thing is alive, but it is. Those Look at those tiny leaves. Just covered in the felt. Covered in the tiny little hairs. Just totally adapted to growing on this, this barren lava rock. You know, the silver swords and Hawaiian volcano tops do the same thing. At least, uh, you know, just being, just having this kind of white leaf. Much different form of a plant. They look more, they almost look more like an agave. You know, much longer lanceolate leaves, but again, just almost blue, almost like a bluish white. And of course we got Canactus de Glossii growing here. Our old friend Canactus de Glossii. The fucking plant is everywhere. It's probably, you know, probably a species complex. You know, because they, they occupy such a wide variety of different habitats and they can have a much different form to them. You know, is it just phenotypic plasticity? Is there something going on? If you looked at the DNA, would the populations be remarkably different? Maybe you got a cryptic species in there? Who knows? Beautiful plant, though, and it's apparently thriving on the uh, 
and the lava. Let's get up close and uh, look at those, uh, oh yeah, look at those florets. You got the pink anther tubes, glandular phyleries, and lacy foliage, ooh. Yeah, as you can see, that buckwheat's uh, doing pretty well for itself right here. Eked out a little niche. It's another word people like to correct you, a niche. <laughs> Just say niche. I'm a gringo, I say niche. Look at that, though. There's got to be a few hundred, probably a few thousand plants right here. Look at that. So you got you got some uh, umbilatums too right there, but it's mostly just uh, Ariagonum avaliifolium focarium. That's why it's wild. How do you evolve to grow on basalt flows? How many generations and mutations does that take? A lone umbilatum surrounded by a few dozen of the uh, endemic buckwheat. Again, and how far do the roots go out? How far do those roots go out? Bet they come out to at least here. That's, I mean, that's why they look so neatly arranged. Almost like somebody planted them. Yeah, the park service, the park service comes out here and plants them for you. Just to make the scenery nice for the visitors who do the loop drive. Don't get out of their car for more than a minute or two. Just buckwheats and limber pines. You know, interesting to note too that uh, the maximum age of this lava flow is 15,000 years, which is a relatively short period of time. Yet in that period of time, uh, this plant has evolved to just completely dominate this landscape. So that kind of answers the question for you. How long, how long does it take? How many generations does it take for this kind of ecological setup to occur? You know, about 15,000 years at max. Now, maybe there were a couple, you know, basalt flows before that that just paled in comparison to this one. So maybe that, you know, it got a head start. But uh, but this landscape you're looking at is still relatively new. 15,000 years is the blink of an eye in geologic time. Oh, this is nice. So we got an origin story. This is a uh, normal... Ovalifolium, Ariagonum ovalifolium. Presumably what that uh, lava buckwheat speciated from sometime in the last 15,000 years. Much different leaf shape, you know, you don't have those rosettes. Whole different uh, morphology here. How about that? Look at that, look at the leaves of that thing. Just little white rosettes, little white fluffy rosettes. Almost looking like uh, some sort of deranged popcorn. Look at, the, look at the leaves on this bastard. Look at that. Just an adaptation. That, that lava has got to get so hot, that substrate that these are growing in. So you can see the leaves are somewhat elevating themselves off that ground, still staying in these tightly clumped rosettes with uh, relatively short internodes. And it only took 15,000 years for this... Uh, kind of morphology to evolve but again it was probably at a head start there were probably probably baby steps who knew who knows look at it there's one of those those stems look at how look at how tightly clumped those leaves are together again just forming almost little rosettes and a connectus of course there you go with those pink anther tubes, those little white curly Q styles poking out. Oh, look, you got some bitter root here too. Way past the, oh, you got some seeds in there. Look at the seeds on the Lewisia and that bitter root. Still alive, but it's uh, it's dormant, closed up shop. Probably more than a few inches into that, uh, that pumice. 
down below. You see another one too. Yeah, they were uh, they were, they were going off uh, two two three months ago probably. Yeah, see, there, there's the seeds from that bitter root. Yeah, so I'm just gonna help it get around, do the plant a favor. Look at how tacky this looks. All right, not like not like Donald Trump tacky, but like you know tacky tacky, like uh, you know like some sort of like putty. Imagine that. What was that like when this was a you know 1100 degrees? That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, you could just you could see. I mean, you could really see the the texture it is, and uh, the way it moved just by how this piece cooled. Another species, of Areogonum. Areogonum microthecum. The nice woody stem. Carline leaves, not safe potatoes like those other ones. Not forming a little mat. This guy's not even uh, not even blooming yet. But we've been seeing this guy all around, you know, all around uh, the northern Great Basin. Can look, it's like it's like Freddy Krueger's mask, like Freddy Krueger flesh kind of. You all know, the pock marks and everything, you know, like a burn victim. <laughs> it's it's kind of morbid, I guess, huh? Look at all the pentstem induced this. All those little yellow. Little yellow perennial uh, penstemons. The leaves are just yelling because it's late in the season. But it's actually a pretty beautiful plant when it's going off. Cute little white penstemon flowers. There's that Stefano Mary again. Look at it. How does it do that? How does it do that? How does it grow so exposed and still it's, it's flowering? It's totally flowering. But it's also totally leafless save for a few uh, deep within that net of photosynthetic stems. This Stefano Maria has a horrible smell to it, which does not surprise me because a lot, a lot of plants in that, uh, in that chicory subfamily do, like that, uh, <clears throat> that invasive uh, species of lettuce with that uh, bleeds of latex. It smells fucking terrible. So it seems like a rather unforgiving environment. It is. There's no topsoil. It's black rock. It gets hot as balls in the summer, but. Uh, I bet you go six inches down, maybe seven inches down one of those fissures or one of those cracks and it's drastically cooler. I mean, how, how else could pikas live here in low elevation limber pine? Look, the Persia, is, is it going off? The Persia tridentata? No, it's basically, basically done. This member of the rose family. The deer love eating this, though. It's still pretty incredible that anything, anything can grow here. Talk about a selective pressure. Look, again, with the toothpaste analogy. The fucking toothpaste analogy. Me and the fucking toothpaste analogy. Look, hard exterior crust, yet it kept flowing within. And so it, you had this cavity. It's a nice cavity. How deep, how, where does it go? How deep down does it go in there? Can you see in there? Or it goes, goes quite far in there. How about that? Put the cap on a fucking toothpaste when you're done, prick. Look at the fruit on this Persia. Look at that. Peel that calyx open, and you got a little droop in there. And it just pops. Look at that. Look at that. Look at the juice come out. A single seed inside. See, good old Facilia has started just about wrapping up for the season. All the flowers basically done, but you can still see those scorpioid cymes and at the venation, that distinct venation on those those leaves all covered in the hairs and with the shit with the mint green color to them nice. Get some aphids on that one. Look at you got glands. You got glands on the calyx. Everything's covered in the glands. Got talk about a selective pressure growing on miles of hot black basalt. <laughs> so talk about something that's going to induce speciation. Induce evolutionary divergence. And indeed it already has with that buckwheat. Still just considered a subspecies, but does look remarkably different from uh, Ovalifolium. You got some nice uh, volcanic badlands in northern New Mexico too. You got them in Modoc County, California. Let's hear it for flood basalts. This, however, was not uh, 
due to the gracious uh, benefactor, the Farallon plate, though. This was uh, something else entirely. Was the Farallon plate responsible for the uh, extensional tectonics in the region? I don't know. Anyway, that's all I got for you this afternoon. Have a good rest of your day. Don't, uh, don't burn up out there. Go fuck yourself. Bye.